Chaya Bhagavan. My name is Professor Mohamed Bukar. I work with the University of Madiburi in Nigeria as a lecturer and with the University of Madiburi Teaching Hospital as an honorary consultant obstetrician and gynecologist. The title of my lecture is Clinical Application of International Ovarian Tumor Analysis at Next Model with Case Examples. The learning objectives are to be acquainted with the IOTA at Next Model and to apply this model in clinical practice. All images for this presentation were of patients managed in two hospitals in Medigori, the capital of Borno State. These are the sounds and sights of Borno State, the home of Imagine Peace. Now, looking at the assessment of different neoplasias in the Atnexa, which is the Atnex model which is a multi-class model, which not only differentiates between benign and American lesions, but also sub-classifies the American lesions into borderline, stage one, stage two to four, metastatic, and also assigns risks. Now, let's look at case examples. This app is available for free on the Arita website. There are nine variables in the IOTA ATNIS model. You have six ultrasound scan variables and three clinical variables. The ultrasound variables are the maximum diameter of the lesion, two, the maximum diameter of the largest solid component, three, more than 10 locules, yes or no, four, number of papillary projections, five acoustic shadows, present or absent, and ascites, whether it's present or absent. The three clinical variables are the age of the patient, whether the patient is from an oncology center or not, and CA125, which is the only optional variable. These are the nine variables we talked about. One, two, and nine are the clinical variables. Three to eight are the six ultrasound variables. The six ultrasound variables are one, the maximum diameter of the lesion in millimeters, the maximum diameter of the largest solid component, more than 10 locules, yes or no, Number of papillary projections, none, one, two, three, or more than three. Now, if you are taking the measurements of a papillary projection, do not include the measurement of the cyst wall. Only measure the height of the papilla. If it's greater than three millimeters, it is a papillary projection. If it is less than three millimeters, it is wall irregularity. Now, if you have a papilla with an indentation like this, which is less than 50%, it is considered as a single papilla. If the indentation is more than 50%, it is considered as two separate papillae. Now, look at this ultrasound scan image and look at this. Is this a single papilla or there are two papillae? Not a record appropriately. Acoustic shadows, yes or no? Ascites, yes or no? Now I've imputed the variables of a patient we manage without CA125, which is an optional variable. When you do that and click on calculate, this box will pop up and ask you that are you certain that CA125 is not available. The field is indeed optional, 
but this will decrease the discrimination between stage 2 to 4 invasive tumor and the other malignant subtypes. When you click yes, the analysis will pop up with these color codings. This representing chance of benign tumor, this represents the risk of metastatic cancer to the adnexa, this represents risk of stage 2 to 4, this represents risk of stage 1, and the yellow color represents risk of borderline tumor. Let's start with the first case. The first case was a 17-year-old student who had laparotomy in the peripheral center and was referred after symptoms recovered. She presented, she presented with progressive abdominal swelling and weight loss. This were the ultrasound scan images. We imputed this information on the ADNES model. And this is what we have. Risk of benign lesion, risk of malignant lesion, and the highest is stage 2 to 4. And clinically, they have stage 4 disease. She had surgery, and histopathology confirmed that it was a yolk sac tumor. Case number 2 was a 31 year old single lady who presented with a two year history of abdominal pain and three months history of abdominal mass. Her C125 was 40. This were the transabdominal images, and this was a transvaginal image. I want us to pay particular attention to a transvaginal image. Here you can see the solid lesion with some cystic components. Here you can see the largest cyst giving H shadowing. So this H shadowing should not be imputed into the ADES model as presence of shadowing because the shadowing is not arising from the substance or from the parenchyma of the lesion. If this is imputed as presence of acoustic shadowing into the ANDES model, the risk of benign lesion will go up and that of benign lesion will come down and this will have a disastrous consequence on the management of the patient. We imputed all these variables, including the CA125, and this is what we have as the risk of benign, and risk of malignant lesions, and you can see the distributions of the malignant lesions. Clinically, there was stage 2A disease. Here, you can see the risk of benign has gone to 76.9%. Why? Because I imputed acoustic shadowing as being present. This is the consequence of wrongly imputing a shadowing into the ADNES model. The management of this patient will be suboptimal and the outcome will be regrettable if that is done. That is why it's extremely important to understand the terms, definitions, as proposed by the IOTA group, and to understand what is acoustic shadowing in the context of malignant lesions. She had surgery, and it's supposedly confirmed that it was a mucinous papillary cyst adenocarcinoma. Case number three was a 50 year old gram multipara who presented with abdominal swelling of one year and abdominal pain of four months duration. This were the data sound scan imaging, typical Swiss cheese appearance. When you apply the ADNES model, you can see that the highest relative risk was for stage one malignant lesion. Of course, it was stage one malignant lesion on clinical examination. She has surgery, and the surgery confirmed that it was adult granulosa cell tumor. Case number four was a 43 year old gram multiparous woman who presented with a two year history of recurrent abdominal pain and abdominal swelling over a few months. These were data sound scan images. We imputed this information on the model. You can see the risk of benign lesion, risk of malignancy, and the highest was for stage two to four. She had surgery, and this was a specific surgery, and histopathology confirmed that. It was a fibroma. 
Case number five was a 57 year old multipara who was managed for intestinal obstruction by the surgeon a year prior to presentation. Her C125 was 20. These were her ultrasound images. We imputed this information, and you can see the risk of benign lesion, risk of malignancy, and the highest risk was for stage one disease. She had surgery, and it's a pathology confirmed that what she had was high grade serous carcinoma with metastasis in the colon. Case number six was a 30 year old para two who presented with a five month history of abdominal swelling, vomiting, epigastric pain, and weight loss. This way, the ultrasound can find this. When you imputed this information on the ADES model, the highest risk was for malignancy, and the highest subgroup was stage two to four. But it was stage four disease by clinical staging. She had surgery, and its pathology confirmed that it was cystic carcinoma with metastasis to the cervix. Case number seven was a 20 year old para two, visually impaired woman. She presented with abdominal pain and abdominal mass. This were her ultrasound scan images. We imputed all this information. You can see the risk of benign lesion, the risk of malignant lesion, and the highest was stage one disease. Clinical assessment was stage four disease. She had surgery. And the histopathology is shorter that this were scalar duval bodies. So it was a yolk sac tumor. Case number eight was a 60 year old gram multipara who was 10 years postmenopausal, presented with a five month history of abnormal uterine bleeding, non diabetic, but she was transfused for four units because of the abnormal uterine bleeding. This were data sound scan images. On surgical assessment, this is granular cell tumor, especially with disappearance of the endometrium at the age of 60. We imputed all this information, and the risk was highest for stage two to four disease, but clinically, it was stage one disease. She had surgery, and it's a pathology confirmed that it was adult granular cell tumor. Case number nine, with 34 year old para three who presented with a five month history of amenorrhea, UPT was positive but became negative a week after laparotomy. This were well, data science scan pictures, typical Swiss cheese appearance. We imputed all this information, and you can see the risk of a benign lesion here and the risk of malignant lesion. It was a stage one disease clinically. She had surgery, and the pathology showed that this were called exna bodies. So it was a case of adult granular cell tumor. Case number ten was a seventy-year-old para six who was thirty years postmenopausal, who presented with a three-week history of abdominal pain and swelling. Look at the C125, two hundred and thirty. This were the ultrasound scan images. We imputed this information first with CA 125 and the second without CA 125. Now with CA 125, look at the risk of benign lesion and the risk of malignancy. At the highest was for stage two to four. Now look at the percentage here, 67.6% with CA 125. The next slide is without CA 125. So let's compare. You see that? This is without CA 125. So this is the importance of CA125. When the CA125 is imputed, the area under the cap is 0.94. Without CA125, without CA125 is 0.93. So clinically, it was stage three C disease. She has surgery, and seven liters of straw colored fluid, acetic fluid, was drained. This is a specimen of surgery. And here, I'm just trying to compare the ultrasound scan image and the image at surgery. When we cut the specimen open, you can look at the comparison. This is papillary projection here, seen at this edge. This is what is seen here, gross specimen. This papillary projection is this one that is seen here. Here you can see this papillary projection again, seen here. And the largest papillary projection is the one that is seen here. Look at this irregular scepter. You can see it's seen here. With what looks like lambda sign here, it can also be seen here. And look at the the external excrescence here and the external excrescence here. So the histopathology showed us that this were the Samona bodies who you suspected on ultrasound scan based on those echogenic spots. So it was a serous papillary cystic carcinoma with peritoneal metastasis, and Samona bodies were present. So our take-home message 
is that knowledge of iota lexicon is essential. This I have covered in one of my lectures. The iota sharing group recommended a two-step strategy where if the benign simple descriptors is inconclusive, you move straight to the at next model. But importantly, subjective assessment by an expert remains the best in characterizing adnex diagnosis. Thank you very much for listening. Oh, it's a good idea,